Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm delighted to be here. I hope you all are as well. And I'm also deeply honored to share the stage with uh, two exemplary artists who both happen to call the San Francisco Bay Area their home, Bernie Krauss and David Harrington. They're <laughs> <laughs> Their respective contributions to their fields of work is nothing short of extraordinary. In terms of our ethos here at the Exploratorium, they both embody our values of curiosity and lifelong learning through their ever-evolving creative practices. Before I give you brief introductions on both of them, which I must say was extremely challenging to keep brief, given their extensive accomplishments, I would like to thank our public programs and AV teams here at the museum. These folks work so hard week after week, uh, putting on amazing programming to keep the Exploratorium dynamic and the exchange of ideas flowing. Thank you. I would also like to thank our incredible partners in presenting the Great Animal Orchestra, the Foundation Cartier. It has been a pleasure to work closely with the wonderful Foundation Cartier team. Their dedication to bringing forward the work of artists like Bernie Krauss, and the co-artists for the Great Animal Orchestra installation, United Visual Artists, is to be lauded. They commit 100% to their projects and the artists they work with, and it really shows. Thank you for being marvelous partners in bringing the Great Animal Orchestra to the Exploratorium. <laughs> It's very exciting for me to introduce Bernie's partner in conversation tonight, David Harrington, violinist and founder of the San Francisco-based and world-renowned Kronos Quartet. Kronos is legendary, visionary, and one of the most celebrated influential groups of our era. They have truly reimagined what a string quartet experience could be. Kronos Quartet has given thousands of concerts worldwide, has released more than 70 recordings, working with countless composers and performers. Through its nonprofit organization, the Kronos Performing Arts Organization, they have commissioned more than 1,000 works. Its most ambitious commissioning effort to date is the recently completed Kronos 50 for the Future. Through this initiative, Kronos has commissioned and distributed online for free 50 and distributed online for free 50 new string quartet works written by composers from around the world. The quartet tours several months each year and appearing in celebrated venues across the globe and their expansive discography includes three Grammy winning albums. Kronos's work has been featured prominently in many films, including the live documentary, A Thousand Thoughts, written and directed by Sam Green and Joe Beanie, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2018. So given all that, wow, <laughs> the stories David could tell. We're so delighted to have you with us tonight in conversation. I also not only have the privilege of introducing you tonight to Bernie Krause, but I've, I've had the wonderful privilege of working with Bernie over the last few years in preparation for the presentation of the Great Animal Orchestra. I'm so grateful for the time that I have been able to spend with this extraordinary human and his inspiring spouse, Kath, spouse Catherine Krauss, who's out here somewhere. <laughs> She's very much a force in her own right. Uh, for over 50 years, Bernie has been collecting and studying the sounds of the natural world. Bernie is a musician by training, first violin, then guitar, and played early in his, uh, and early in his career, worked as a music producer, engineer, and played for a time with the folk music group, The Weavers. He came, <laughs> also getting hit rounds of applause. He came to California to study electronic music at Mills College, and together with his musical partner, the late Paul Beaver, helped introduce the synthesizer to pop music and film working with many talents of the day. In the late 60s, his career path led him to devoting his life to soundscape ecology, and I will let Bernie tell you more about that. He spent decades traveling over the world, recording in wild places from the jungles of the Amazon to the tundras of the far north and the oceans in between. And I believe that he told me his archive holds somewhere in the order of 5,000 orders hours of recordings. And from these recordings, there's been numerous album releases, 
Uh, his work has been mixed into ambient tracks for feature films, and his words, works, his recordings, which are works of art and science, were often commissioned by museums, aquaria, zoos, and zoos for their dioramas and installations. I, I could go on and on. Uh, in 2014, he, he premiered a, a collaboration with composer Richard Blackford, the Great Animal Orchestra Symphony for Orchestra at Wild Soundscapes, performed by the BBC National Orchestra of Wales and conducted by Martin Brabens. The work integrates the natural soundscapes into the orchestral textures of a major symphonic piece. In 2015, Krauss and Blackford premiered the score for their first ballet, Biophony, performed by Alonzo King Lines Ballet at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Bernie has auth also authored several books, including the influential Great Animal Orchestra, Finding the Origins of Music in the World's Wild Places, and his most recent book from 2021, The Power of Tranquility in a Very Noisy World. There are lots of ways to access the work of our speakers tonight, and I encourage everyone to take any opportunity you have to dive in, read one of Bernie's books, attend a Kronos performance, or settle in with some recordings. Your mind and spirit will be so glad you did. So, Bernie and David, welcome to the Exploratorium stage tonight. Thank you. We hardly have to say a thing. I know. We can, we can, we can go. <laughs> it's all been said. We can go. <laughs> I will start. Um, both of you are, were based in the San Francisco Bay Area in the early days of the Exploratorium. And for folks who may not know, the Exploratorium was founded by physicist Dr. Frank Oppenheimer, who wanted to create a new kind of hands-on museum for people to engage in art, science, and the world around them. 50 years later, we believe he succeeded. And I understand that the both of you knew Frank Oppenheimer. Uh, can you share your experiences during those founding years of the Exploratorium and your evolving relationship with the museum? Maybe David, you want to start? Well. When Kronos arrived in San Francisco in 1977, uh, I think about the third phone call I made was to the Exploratorium to try to get a, uh, a meeting with Frank. And uh, um, shortly after going over to the Exploratorium, uh, we were invited to play. And who should sit in the front row but Frank Oppenheimer? and. Uh, uh, the force of his listening and his personality and, and the way he uh, appreciated life and encouraged curiosity was thrilling and very inspirational. And um, uh, I kind of recognized uh, something in Frank. When I was a kid, I always liked to sit in the front row too. And uh, <laughs> so I think he was kind of a, a kid. <laughs> Do you have a recording, maybe, that we could um, a clip the, of the early days at the Exploratorium? Can we? Can yeah, we bring this, that this in? is not necessarily the earliest days, but yeah, let, let's play a little bit. Uh, uh, I had a young uh, recording engineer go over to the old Exploratorium and record. Can can you play that, Wayne? <clears throat> It's like a, a different kind of great animal orchestra, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> It's fabulous. It really picks up the sound of the uh, of the place, how it sounded. Yeah. yeah. There's about an hour of that wow. recording, and wow. you hear kids <laughs> having such a great time, and you know, learning new things, and yeah, it was fabulous. So, how about you, Bernie? How did you meet Frank? Wow. Well, I met Frank one morning a few blocks from here on Hyde Street. Uh, it was two o'clock on an October morning. I was out recording, of all things, the splices of the cables that ran underneath the street so that I could cap capture 
a rhythm track for a new album that I was recording with my late music partner, Paul Beaver, uh, called In a Wild Sanctuary. And we wanted to contrast natural soundscapes with uh, industrial sound. And the, the cable, cables over these guide wheels uh, really established that. And I'd finished recording, and I looked around, and there's this kind of shadowy figure standing under a streetlight. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's San Francisco, and who knows what the hell's happening at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but as soon as I finished, he began to walk toward me and I was, as I was packing my equipment away. And he said, what are you doing? <laughs> Speaking of curiosity, I said, well, I'm recording these cable car sounds. He said, what for? I said, because I'm doing an album. And then he said, I want to talk with you. <laughs> and he invited me to a all-night cafe down on Polk Street, and we spent the rest of the night talking about his new adventure. And finally, he introduced himself. He said, my name is Frank Oppenheimer. And it didn't strike me, you know, what the connections all were at that moment. But after a while, I said, Frank, I said, uh, where are you from and who? I said, are you related to any other Oppenheimers? <laughs> What can I tell you? <laughs> it was late. <laughs> anyway, um, we struck up a conversation and for many years after tried to think of a way to incorporate uh, some kind of sound program into the Exploratorium. But two things weren't happening at that moment. One, the technology wasn't there to do what we wanted to do. And secondly, the venue that they had over uh, in uh, at the Palace of Fine Arts was very reverberant, and it wasn't a really good venue to put sound in. And it wasn't until actually we had really tried to install um, a piece like the Great Animal Orchestra in venues that were, uh, you know, that uh, that had some of the same kinds of problems that the original venue did, and ways to overcome that. And Cartier was the group that really established that model so that we could play in places like this and have the piece performed. Frank's, yeah. Frank was the initiator of that. Yeah, it was 50 years in the making to get We've been it. Since 1968, wow. we've been thinking about wow. this. So circling back to the Great Animal Orchestra, I wonder if Bernie, you could tell us um, how the installation that we're hosting here until October 15th came about. How? Uh, well, it came about because, you know, we've been talking about it for so long. And uh, as I was saying to David the other day and, and Kirsten, uh, well, what happens when you, when you don't succeed the first time? And it reminded me of a Rilke comment, uh, who speaks of victory, to endure is everything. And uh, we've been working on that premise ever since. So, um, I, I'm not really clear on the question, Kristen. Yeah, so I, how did it, how did uh, you get introduced to Foundation Cartier and the ah, work that. at, yeah, and the work. Okay, there's a, uh, an anthropologist who lives in Uruguay, and uh, he happened to pick up a French translation of the Great Animal Orchestra book uh, in Uruguay. He's an anthropologist that works very closely with the Yanomami tribe in northern Brazil. That's the tribe that is being decimated right now by gold miners and, and loggers in Brazil, and you may have read about that. But he's been working with the Yanomami for many years now, and uh, he picked up the book in, in 2013, read it, and sent a note to his friend Hervé Chandez, who's the director, the artistic director of the uh, Fondation Cartier in Paris. He's from Uruguay, it went to Paris, and all of a sudden, we get a call. Uh, can I come out and visit you? Because I want to talk to you about doing a project, maybe. And he came to California. We spent a week together uh, going over material. And he decided, uh, after listening to the archive, that there was a, a, a way that we could work together and create a piece. And uh, they took a great risk at, and great expense to put together the first iteration of the Great Animal Orchestra. 
first of all in Paris. It opened in Paris in 2016 and there's been several countries uh, and venues sin since then. Uh, and now it's getting its uh, premiere here in San Francisco um, this year. And it's uh, taken us, I guess, that long, 50 some odd years now to get it here and we're just so thrilled. Really could be better. Um, and how did you begin recording sounds in nature? How did that um, come about? Um, well, there are several reasons for that. One, I wasn't feeling very well. I was working as a professional musician in the studio in Hollywood, New York, and London. And uh, I was always working inside in closed environments. I never saw, I never worked in a recording studio with a window uh, that you could see the outside world. And with a bad case of ADHD, I was feeling quite ill. And I really wanted to work outside. And finally, uh, after getting fired eight times while working on Apocalypse Now, I decided that was maybe my <laughs> message. <laughs> and <laughs> I went back to school, got my PhD in uh, creative sound arts and with an internship in bioacoustics. I've never looked back. I worked outside. It's the most thrilling thing I've ever done in my life. And I feel great. I'm <laughs> so turning to David here, do you have a moment or something that uh, led to your life as a musician and your founding of the Kronos Quartet? Well... When I was 12, I joined the Columbia Record Club. <laughs> some of you know, remember this? You s send in your penny and you got to make some choices. Well, I was reading a biography of Beethoven and I was right up to that point where I was learning about the late quartets. Well, I didn't know what a late quartet was. I, I had played violin since age nine and. Anyway, so I, uh, one of my choices was the Budapest Quartet playing Opus 127, the first of the late quartets. So uh, a week or so later, it arrived, and um, I put it on, and that first E-flat major chord just totaled me out. I just loved that sound. And... Um, Sort of what I've always done is if I hear something that is totally engaging and just magnetizes me, I have to learn how to do it myself. And so um, I was playing in the Seattle Youth Symphony at that time. So I knew an other violinists. I knew violists and cellists. And uh, so after going down to the Seattle Public Library and checking out the music to the Opus 127, I called up some friends and we got together and um, for a tenth of a second it sounded like the Budapest Quartet. <laughs> and, um, uh, I've always, ever since then, believed in the value of tenths of seconds and, uh, and, um, and basically through high school uh, I j what I really always wanted to do was play string quartet music. And um, and then, uh, you know, after that, I was able, by accident, to hear Black Angels by George Crumb on the radio. And I realized I have to play that piece. And this was, you know, in the era of the war in Vietnam. And all of a sudden, that piece spoke to me in a way. And, and I felt like I had a response. And... I got the score to that work, and I, it, you take one look at it, and it's very clear. You, you're going to have to work really hard to play that piece. You can't sight read it. You can't, you know. And and so that's why I started Kronos. And um, there's a lot of other ins and outs that led me and keep leading me on in music. But um, basically, it's it, it's hearing something that just Pulls you. you know, I'm sure it's the same way, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you don't have any choice. And, and you know, the other day, uh, 
Bernie played for me uh, one of the, the um, what would you call it, episodes of the Great Animal Orchestra, the, the yeah. Wolves. Yeah. yeah. The, the segment. The segment, yeah. And, and if you listen really carefully, and I don't, I'm not sure I would have known this unless you would have told me, but the wolves actually start before they, they do their vocalization. vocalization. There's a sound they make, and it's like, like that. And I said to Bernie, I said, every violinist in the entire world knows that sound. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like to have your ear right next to the to violin because it's it's the sound of the white noise the bow makes on the string, right? And so, um, anyway, uh, well, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the Great Animal Orchestra invites us to consider um, our changing environment through engaged listening, um, and I wonder. David, also, again, how you, um, how Cronus's work confronts the issues of our day through performance and collaboration, and do you have future plans that would you would like us to know about in terms of? Well, um, you know, at a certain moment, um, it was in 2003, and I, I, I was talking to Howard Zinn, um, whom I didn't know, but I, I got his home phone number, and I, I needed some advice. <laughs> And uh, that was in March. In April, I was in his office, right? And he gave me four points of advice um, when I asked, what can a normal person do? And the first thing he said is, well, musicians and types like you are not normal people, so you, because you kind of think in different ways, okay. Uh, and th you have to remember, this was uh, during the build-up to the invasion of Iraq, right? Um, secondly, you can't do anything by yourself. You need a community. Third, you need to, need to take every opportunity you have, which is what I'm going to do in just one minute, Bernie. And fourth, people like Rumsfeld and Bush and Cheney and those types are actually afraid of people like us because we can imagine a world without creating violence and hatred and, and uh, destruction. We, we can imagine actually making things beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so what happened to me is when Howard said that, uh, you know, Rumsfeld was afraid of me, I, all of a sudden I thought, okay, all right, here we are. But Getting back to taking every opportunity about projects. Um, so if, if you encounter the great animal orchestra, uh, it, it's, like, it's like encountering all of these instruments that you never, instrumental sounds that you never thought of. And so, Bernie, what does a guy like me do with an orchestra like that. I mean, in other words, it seems like this magnificent um, opportunity to explore, to make something new, to find ways of interacting with our instruments and the, the uh, incredible, um, I would call, call it weavings that you discovered in nature, the, these places where each animal has its own frequency, its, its own place in, in the sonic field. And you were pointing out to me the other day that there's plenty of room for more, you know. Wow. Well, one of the things, David, is that um, we learned about beauty from the natural world. We learned what beauty is because we, sp we have spent the rest of our lives from the time we emerged on the plains of Africa emulating that and mimicking what we've heard and what we've seen and the movements that we've seen have evolved into dance. 
the sounds that we've heard have evolved into the kinds of things that you're doing with the quartet. Uh, we couldn't have imagined or done that without that influence and, uh, and intrinsic connection in the, in the very beginning. And we're still doing it. So that world goes on. And if I can see, can I, uh, Wayne, could you show me the uh, spectrogram that we had there? We're talking about the ways that sound is organized. And you can see this is a spectrogram, graphic illustration of sound that you're seeing in the Great Animal Orchestra performance itself. And if I may, I can show you the ways in which these animals find niches that are very clear patterns across the page that actually looks to me when I first heard this and saw this, saw these spectrograms, it reminded me of a, of a, a, a score by Boulez. So it's, it's that accurate. The, these are, these sounds down here, are the lowest. Much neater than a score by Boulez. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. But anyway, that's what I thought of when I first saw it. But anyway, this is the lowest sound that we can hear right around in here. And these are the highest sounds that we can hear. So you can get a sense of the scope of this thing. Around 4,100 hertz is the highest note on a piano. So you can see where that lies. And uh, so this is how, this is the structure that we learned, the ways in which we learned uh, is by listening to the sounds of the natural world. And we learned structure from that composition. Uh, and this is where we're at today with the kinds of things the Kronos Quartet is doing. That, so the Great Animal Orchestra is really key to, uh, it unlocks the key, it's the, um, it's the Rosetta Stone that, uh, that has informed our culture. And that's why it's so exciting to me. I mean. To me, I can't imagine anything uh, uh, greater than connecting with the animal world in that kind of way and letting the animals teach us because that's where we learned in the first place and we've forgotten that important connection. And, you know, when I'm thinking about this and, and just thinking about our future work and future possibilities, um, it seems to me there are just enormous opportunities. It, it, it's like there's a whole new palettes of possibilities, of I interactions between um, worlds that you've recorded and music that hasn't been written or played yet, you know? Yeah. We were, uh, David and I haven't seen each other in about 40 or 50 years, so <laughs> this is the first time we got together was the other day, actually on Monday. Uh, so it's been a while, we have a lot of catching up to do. But one of the things we thought of uh, that we would explore this evening is a kind of scenario where we would actually collaborate. And to figure, it's very dangerous territory for, for artists, but it's certainly, it's certainly fun to, to work on those ideas and see what can happen and what can come out of, you know, a relationship. Um, so, um, where should we start? Uh, let's hear something. Okay. Can, can we hear one How's of your... Okay, let's, let's hear uh, number six. Let me explain to you what this is first, Wayne, before, before I do this. Um, a friend of mine by the name of Louis Sarno uh, is a musical anthropologist. In 1984, he heard a, uh, a piece on NPR uh, that was recorded by Colin Turnbull, who was a very famous musical anthropologist at one point, and had recorded uh, uh, some pygmy groups in Africa. And he heard one of these recordings from the Bayaka pygmies from, from the Central African Republic Zanga Sanga rainforest. And the sounds were so beautiful to him that he sold everything he had. He's a friend of Jim Jarmusch, by the way, uh, and w they went to school together. And Jim helped fund Louis' trip to Africa, bought him a one-way ticket to Bangui, <laughs> and Louis spent the rest of his life until a couple of years ago when he died, um, uh, recording the sounds of the music of the Bayaka pygmies, which is some of the most gorgeous 
work you've ever heard, and it is actually part of our archive. Uh, we not only have the sounds of the Bayaka singing and dancing, but also the whole habitat in which they lived to show how they used the sounds of the natural world uh, as a natural karaoke orchestra with which they perform, how we got our music. So this is an example of that. These are women gathering mushrooms in the forest, and you can hear their voices way far off in the distance. But if, you'll know, if you look at this on a spectrogram, you'll see that their voices fit in one of these niches that's free of acoustic energy so that their sounds can be transmitted and heard by others. The Bayaka octave is uh, like 36 tones, to give you an idea of where that's at. Sometimes more, it depends on what they're singing and what they're uh, vocalizing in relation to uh, the soundscape behind them. And uh, they're uh, initiated into song only when they hear certain sounds in the background of this karaoke orchestra that informs them what to sing. So it's a very uh, interesting connective relationship, and it's highly spiritual to them. Uh, I, I was saying just a moment ago, um, immediately I thought, wow, this sounds like Hildegard von Bingen. The, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, you know, and, and it almost sounds like it's in a cathedral, too. There's um, there's almost a reverb, yeah. Uh, probably, ha at least ha some of it would be because of the distance from each other that they're singing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it signals also to the guys to leave them alone. Yeah. Right. These yeah. are women gathering mushrooms. They don't want to be bothered. Right. <laughs> some of that stuff can be poisonous in Central African Republic. Right. Yeah. Um, Wow, I mean, I I have uh, some of Sarno's. Uh, oh, do you? Uh, CDs, yeah, and they're among my favorite treasures of yeah. recorded music. And and um, um, 
and w you know when I heard the Great Animal Orchestra the other day, it just seemed like there there would be ways that we could jump into some of those recordings. Yeah, there wouldn't even need to be anything changed. Actually, no. that we we could learn to communicate. Well, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do when I've tried to write music to this stuff was to think of the animal uh, sounds, the animal recordings, these biophonies, I call them, uh, to think of them as the, uh, uh, the band behind what I want to do. Yeah. And to fill, to actually play and fill uh, sound within the structure of the niches that you see on the screen. Actually, mm. use that uh, as a as an informative tool mm. th around which to create things. Uh, the biocas, some of the biocas stuff that I have is, I mean, the rhythms are incredible. It's yeah. like it's it's like a three over a seven, or it's some weird timing, you know, mm. and. Mm and many different polyphonies going at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's instructional as well, and it's, it, it's really fascinating to work with and try to unravel not only the Baca material from Central African Republic, but from all over, yeah. from, from the Yukon. One of the reasons that we chose the seven soundscapes that we did to play in the Great Animal Orchestra is because they have such musical potential and uh, particularly in our Western understanding of what music is. Yeah, and the... the that's, an, that's another thing. What is music? What is, yeah. Well, I, I spend every day trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we actually thought we had an answer once when Paul Beaver and I did the uh, Nonsuch Guide to Electronic Music, which was the first album we did. Um, we defined music as control of sound. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Wow. We were so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of uncontrollable, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's interesting to think yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. That's what we think of in the West, though. Right, right. Wow. Have you two ever worked together? Have you... Uh, he would never let me. Well, <laughs> no. and what would you, what would you do? We, 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 we sort of met, tapped in. We met in the early, late 70s, early 80s, right? Yeah. That, that's when we yeah. last saw each other. Yeah. And I, so I saw Bernie a few weeks ago. He looked exactly the same, <laughs> <laughs> you know, after all these years. And, and uh, we kind of just picked up the conversation where we left off, you know, and that's, that's a good sign, I think. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And so the question, the question was, what did we do? Yeah. I, I toss that to you. What I think we need to do is more listening yeah. and find the, the I, I mean, the, the underwater music that I heard of, uh, the, the recordings that you made were absolutely incredible, too. Yeah, David's talking about the, the, the composite piece that you hear in the Great Animal Orchestra called Oceans. And uh, yeah. that's made up of a lot of fish and whale. People don't even know that fish make noise. And, and crustaceans, uh, a lot of coral reef material. And, uh, and it offers a real interesting way to get into this uh, subject. Yeah. Well, one of the... Uh, cool things in your book that I read the other day is that seals actually uh, hear through their whiskers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought, I you know, I, I, I need facts like that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so if we, if we grow a little, uh, yeah. <laughs> we can do it, huh? Okay. Yeah. And and so, I, I mean, I, th I think the, the way to proceed is more listening together yeah. and more um, playing examples that we want to share for each other. Sure. That, that's normally what I do with, with musicians every time I get a chance to interact with another musician. Oh, have you heard this? And, you know, it's, it's always, um, it's one of the great things about yeah. about it is, is... You play off that energy. You play, uh, yeah, yeah, and you yeah. get, you get yeah. to... Uh, um, 
enlarge your vocabulary a little bit. Well, I'm ready. You got your yeah. Calendar? Let's yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Amazing. We can't wait to see what comes out of this partnership. So You heard it first here. <laughs> um, so speaking of listening, I mean, keen listening is so key to experiencing the work that you bring to the world. Can, why do you think it's important that people practice listening? Do you, I would assume that you do both think that. <laughs> hmm. The practice of listening. Well, my license plate says écoute. <laughs> that wasn't from Cartier. No. Um, uh, listening is key. And Pauline Oliveris, who was one of my mentors, uh, just, I said, how are we going to do this? She said, listen. And if we learn to listen, I'm not talking about hearing. We all hear. But not very many of us actually know how to listen. And she used to, she created the idea of these uh, sound walks that she pulled from uh, Murray Schaefer, Canadian composer and philosopher and musician, very fine musician. Uh, and these sound walks mean that you go out and you listen to the world around you. Just step outside and listen to the world around you. And you try to pick out the different sources of sound, the anthrop anthropophonic uh, sounds, like the human sounds that are created from our, all our mechanistic devices and our iPhones and so on. Uh, you learn to pick out the sounds and the sources that are, that are wild sounds. All of the birds that even, uh, even uh, um, inhabit the urban centers that we have. Uh, so you can, you can do l good listening anyway. And when you begin to distinguish the difference between sounds, you then ask the question, what of these sounds make me feel good and what of these sounds make me feel stressed and, and, uh, and, and not feeling good? And then you, s you create a life for yourself as best you can with uh, the sounds th that are life-affirming for you. And... That's really what you need to do. It's very simple. You're not, there's almost nothing to do here. It's not what you do that matters. It's sometimes what you don't do that matters. You know, I, I had a conversation last night with a 14-year-old uh, a composer from Portland, Oregon. And she had proposed a piece uh, to me, writing a piece. And it was about... Um, the preparations that all of her teachers, so I think for age 14, she's probably going into the ninth grade. So imagine kindergarten through eighth grade. All of her teachers had talked about what you need to do if there's a gunman that comes to the school. And so she wanted to write a piece, right? And uh, so I first heard this three months ago, and she and I have been in correspondence since then. And last night we had a Zoom. And she sent a version of the piece. Now, what, what do you say to someone who writes a, an optimistic, kind of gentle piece about that topic? What do you say? And I realized that I was in a position of power, and I'm much older and all this. And so we just started talking about how, how she felt when she heard that all those years, every day. The teacher saying, well, you have to, what is it, cover, turn off the lights, uh, I, I can't remember. There's there's three things. Does, does anybody know what the instructions are? Draw, hide, light. No, hers were different. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we learned here. That's what you learned here? Yeah. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Her, uh, <laughs> hers were different, but they, they, it was something like lock the door, uh, 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 turn off the lights, yeah. Was that it? Lock the door. Yeah. And, and anyway, so her her piece 
was was very gentle and, and so I, I I encouraged her to write a opus one number B. And I said, what would happen if you got really angry? <laughs> would you be able to put that into your music? And anyway, she said, oh, what a good idea. I think I'm going to try. So uh, maybe in a month or two, I'll, I'll get another version of that. But um, now, why did I start talking about that? We're talking about listening. About listening. But I think she should be in on your next project. Yeah. Well, <laughs> see, that's what I was. Ho I was hoping that what what the piece that would result from that would be this amazing thing that would that would you know from the imagination of someone that's lived that for all of those years, she would create something for us adults that we would hear something new that needed to be heard. And I'm not sure that's happened yet, but she definitely has the talent to do it. And so there we that are. That might be an interesting prose. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. To get somebody involved and, and teach us what we need to hear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Profound. So I think um, as we are getting closer to maybe this program, I think we have time to take a couple questions from the audience. Is that, is that right? Yeah. OK. Um, they'll bring a mic out to you. Um, I see one hand here. This is great to see you both. Uh, and you mentioned you met in the early 80s, but how did you actually meet? You two, do you remember? And you know, different fur. Well, yeah, but even before that, there was, I think there was something in the pink pages of the Chronicle about you. Wasn't there? Did I don't. I don't recall. Oh, I. I do recall seeing you at the studio, though. Yeah. No, we were at the studio, different first yeah. studio, and. Um, there was a studio in town that was a very famous uh, studio for a, a while, uh, out in the Mission, mm -hmm. and uh, and many of us crossed paths at that place because it was an important uh, it was an important venue and a lot of good work was coming out of it at that time. And uh, we just met one day yeah. at, uh, when yeah. the quartet was there, and I was really interested in what you guys were doing. It might be that I knew about you from that article. Maybe, yeah. yeah. yeah well, uh, an album had just come out. Yeah, yeah. that's it's, probably it. Yeah, one of our Warner Brothers albums. Yeah. I, think it was, uh, I think it was an album called Gandharva. It was done at Grace Cathedral, and it was the first... Um, it, was, it was done with Jerry Mulligan and Bud Shank, Howard Roberts. Uh, Paul Beaver on five manual organ. I was on. Uh, I played um, synthesizer on that one, and there was a guy by the name of. Most people don't know this. There's a guy by the name of Gail Lawton, and uh, uh, he played two concert harps at the same time, <laughs> at 90 degree, 90 degree angles. Wow. And um, he, at 16 years old, was the harpist that did all of the actual playing. And Harpo Marx in the Marx Brothers movies for Harpo Marx, 16 years old. Can you wow. imagine? Wow. And he played on our album. We, we, we wanted him for historic reasons. <laughs> Those are important reasons. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, you, what you were saying about listening um, really struck me because about I don't know, 15 years ago when I retired, I started going to recitals at the Conservatory of Music in the evening frequently, like three or four times a week. And those students are extremely talented and it's a wonderful experience and the, and the recitals are free. And all my life before that, I was able to have classical music on, non-vocal music on when I was reading at home. But after listening to those, I mean, I think re I started really listening because I was doing it so often. Now I can't read and have music playing at the same time. The, music's, the, this, the music totally draws my attention away yeah. from the reading. Yeah. And that's a good thing, by the way. You should either listen to music or, I mean, I, I think our time is so short and there's so much to learn and hear. 
in this world. And uh, if I'm listening to music, I've got to hear the music. I can't be distracted by anything else. I mean, I really have to focus on it. Thanks. Uh, we're all grown-ups here tonight, um, and my kids are grown, so I was wondering, could you give us some insight on, like, just as the symphony has played across the world, how are kids reacting to it? Well, that's a great question. Um, kids respond to animals and animal sounds in ways that they don't respond to anything else. And uh, one of the great successes of the Great Animal Orchestra is the ways in which these animal sounds, I, I, they're the artists, not me. Uh, I, it, it just kind of passes through what we're doing at this point. We're trying to feature what it is that they do. And they reach kids. Um, and they reach kids in the same way no matter what the culture is because natural sounds are not culturally biased as music is. Music always has a, you know, it's, it, relates, it comes from Africa, it comes from Cuba, it comes from wherever. And um, uh, so natural soundscapes are universal. And they reach kids in a universal way. We had kids from, uh, when we uh, played this thing in Seoul, South Korea, we had the same reaction to kids who were five or six years old that we did in China when we were in Shanghai, th that we did in France when we first played this uh, piece in Paris in 2016. It hasn't changed. It's universal. It captures their attention. They sit mesmerized watching the screen and the, and the spectrogram go by. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, it's really astonishing how it, how it affects them in ways that it, does, it affects us differently, but it still gets us in this much the same way. Play out here. Uh, with the kids' attention in the, in the installation itself. I think it surprised a lot of us staff here. We have lots of kids on the floor and seeing them so attentive. Yeah, to the I wouldn't sounds. have believed it when I first saw it. Years ago, I saw a documentary by the name of Ishii, The Last Yahi. Yeah. And Bernie, I know you were involved with that project. It, that documentary really affected me to this day, and if anybody doesn't know about it, go see it, because um, anyway, if you would comment on a little bit of who you, Ishii was and your involvement and um, how it affected you. Thank you. Sure, Ishii was uh, the last member of his tribe um, who was found in 1911 cowering in this uh, place up near Chico, a little barn. And he was, uh, he was last member of the Southern Yana tribe and discovered by someone there who uh, uh, turned him over to uh, Alfred Krober, who was a famous one of the first anthropologists at UC Berkeley, um, who in turn brought Ishii to uh, the Phoebe Hearst Museum, in, then at where UCSF is at the hospital now, and uh, established Ishii as an exhibit, okay? Same thing as Oda Benga. I don't remember if I don't know if you remember who Oda Benga was, the the guy stuck in Chicago at at the uh, at the zoo or in St. Louis at the zoo. Um, but this was typical of what was happening at the end of the last century, at the end of the 19th century, and also beginning of the 20th. So Ishii lang languished in that uh, in that environment uh, for many years until 2016. I'm sorry, 1916, when he got uh, contracted uh, consumption and, and died from contact with, you know, with uh, the visitors at the museum. But it wasn't before uh, Edward Sapper, uh, who was also an anthropologist colleague of uh, Krober, um, uh, uh, recorded a lot of his uh, singing and language to, to preserve it. And he recorded it all on wax cylinders. I got a hold of those wax cylinders and began to clean up the tapes so that uh, so that the material could be heard. And the the material on uh, that I had uh, recovered was used in a film called Ishi the Last Yahi that was directed and produced by um, by. Um, 
Uh, it, uh, Jed Reif, thank you. Yeah, I just, some, my brain went dead. Um, and uh, and Kat, Catherine and I were in, in, doing some recording of, uh, of Ishii's territory and actually went up to uh, a ranch just between Red Bluff and, and Mount Shasta, which was part of Ishii territory at one point. And, uh, and while we were on this ranch, a huge, huge, huge ranch, it was 20,000 acres or something like that. And uh, we actually found sites from Ishii's tribe that had been undiscovered on this ranch uh, that were still you know, like fire pits and places where, where uh, structures had been built that were really identified as Southern Yana sites. So, uh, and we were recording the natural soundscape around that area so Jed could use it in the film and match it to the different sites that he was uh, referring to with Ishii. And so that's how, uh, that's how we got involved with Ishii. And there are several examples of uh, those kinds of uh, recordings that were made by anthropologists or just people who were interested in, in recording. As a matter of fact, uh, Edward Curtis, the famous photographer, uh, when he was setting up his, uh, all of his, almost all of his Native American pictures were, were uh, photographs were setups, and he staged them very, very carefully so that people would get a sense of what Curtis's idea of Native American life was like. Um, and as he was setting them up, he recorded them singing and uh, and um, also uh, drumming. So a lot of the recordings that were made of, you know, different famous uh, um, uh, chiefs and, and members of tribes that, that uh, he had photographed were also recorded. And these were just recently found, recently, 20 years ago, found in the uh, Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You can hear things of Chief Joseph, for instance. There are recordings of Chief Joseph from the Nez Perce tribe, and so on. There are a bunch of things like that. Anyway, that's that's a long version of Ishi. Wow, Nick. More question. Hey, uh, first of all, thanks for everything you've done and just being an inspiration. Um, it, you used the phrase Rosetta Stone at some point, and it made me curious what your thoughts are and if you're involved with, uh, there are some efforts these days to use like machine learning and AI to basically decode animal language and communicate with animals. Are you, yeah, is that something you've thought I didn't about much? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first I said thank you. Second I said uh, there's efforts these days to use machine learning and AI to communicate with animals and decode animal language. Uh, is that something you're involved with or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, that's not part of my expertise, so I can't really address that. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I hope to learn a lot about machine learning. Uh, maybe a machine can teach me how to play the violin better. And, uh... Hello. So we have some videos in our micro cinema from the author Karen Baker, who recently released a book called Sounds of Life that's looking at that type of research. So you can check that out. But I want to say one other thing about these soundscapes. They're narratives of place. And when they really work effectively, uh, they actually transport you through these soundscapes to a place and they tell you stories about them. And all we need to do is find that Rosetta Stone that's going to give us the key to unlock those mysteries of uh, what these places are really all about and how we can help, uh, how we can, what, what it is we can do or not do to make the, you know, to continue the idea of the life that's expressed through these soundscapes. Uh, Bernie, I just want to say one thing. Uh, you know, when I experienced this, and I, I already told you this, yeah. I mean, on the one hand, for example, the Amazon recordings that you made, it, the the sound is is it's this beautiful tapestry of of sonic splendor. Yeah. You know. And then you go back five years later, whatever it was, and you hear one bird off in the distance. Yeah. And when I when I heard that, um, f 
for me, it was infinitely sorrowful and sad. And it, it's like um, the, the idea that um, the adults in the room would allow that to happen is totally unacceptable, I think. Yeah. We have to find a way out of that. And we're going to learn. It's, it's Young people are going to teach us what needs to get done. And there might even be, I hope, there will be some solutions that young people will find. But um, at this point in your life, what can you tell us about that topic? Well, first of all, we have to learn to listen, like the gentleman was talking about before. We have to learn to listen because we have to understand what it is we want to address. So we have to understand that better. But listening is key. Uh, these, uh, these soundscapes uh, are, te are reaching out to us to talk about the life-affirming issues that every one of these environments is facing. And uh, we have an obligation to figure out how to make that uh, a right in some way, because disappearing so quickly. I, I'm, I'm figuring now about 70% of my archive comes from habitats that no longer exist. We're not talking about animals. We're talking about whole habitats now. And they're going very fast. Um, this year, uh, in, in, in a place that I've been recording at Sugarloaf Ridge State Park up here in Sonoma, uh, this year alone, um, I've recorded three times there and had absolutely not a single bird sound. Uh, and yet we had a tremendously wet winter. There was lots of vegetation. We've seen lots of birds, but they're not singing. And that, to me, is really scary. We're facing a silent spring, and we're getting, we're getting moments of that. And uh, when John Cage talks about the most important sound in, in, uh, in composition is silence uh, or a rest, uh, he knows what he's talking about. And that's important to think about. Can we take one more? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much um, for the whole evening. It's really fantastic. And the installation is fantastic, too. Thank you. But I have a visual question for you, because I was so taken by the inclusion of water. By inclusion of what? Water. Yeah. And bringing water into the installation and what that does to the environment, because it mirrors and doubles the effect, mm -hmm. and how that you came to that decision because that's it, it it's glowing it's really glowing that was not my fault i've got to blame i've got to blame united visual artists for that what we had a problem doing was illustrating either by sound or some other means low frequency very low frequency material infrasound is what we call it. it's under 20 kilohertz it's under 20 hertz uh, um, and elephants reproduce that, and so does uh, um, some wave action, and so does thunder. And so for those components, we created this reflecting pool around the, uh, around the screen, at the base of the screen. Not so, that it, not so much that it would reflect the other, I mean, the images that are, uh, that are above the pool, but because we had little um, little plungers in in the wa in the edge of, at the edge of the pond that cause ripples when you have very low frequency material, and so whenever you hear thunder or the elephants below a certain uh, range, you'll, you, that plunger will go into action and and ripple just like a a subwoofer, a really good subwoofer, <laughs> only it's connected to water. So you can see the ripples in the water when it's, when it's very low. That's UVA, not me. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, thank you both for... We thank being. you. <laughs> thank you both for being here and for your work.